welcome to Dip In and Out with Lucy, the podcast that opens up the discussion around domestic abuse. I'm here today with the lovely Tanzin Kane. Tanzin is from Smart Financial. She's a chartered financial planner and resolution accredited divorce specialist. And I'm going to hand over to you, Tanzin, to explain a bit more about those roles. Hello, thank you for having me on today. Um, it's really lovely to be a guest on other people's podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Responsibility is all yours today. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I um, I help people with their financial planning and and that's a job that I've been doing for uh, 20 odd years now. So a long time. And um, I went through a divorce myself probably about nine or 10 years ago. And I also have divorced parents and both of those things together made me think the work that I do for or did for my uh ordinary clients that sounds wrong because none of them are particularly ordinary (laughs) they're all amazing Um, but non-divorcing clients um and I kind of thought oh this work would be really useful for people who are going through divorce so I went and did some digging around I spoke to some people who were already working in that niche Mm -hmm. um and we set up smart divorce about oh what year are we 23 8 Nick oh no hang on 2018 so what five six years ago wow um and I went and looked at how to be the best I possibly could be in that that working environment and that led me to become resolution accredited um so if I just tell you a bit about what that is and what it entails Mm -hmm. because it's a bit of a I suppose it doesn't mean much to anyone other than solicitors who who um, kind of all, can also themselves get resolution accredited. So what it means is that you have to have three years of CPD in um, the divorce world. So you kind of need to immerse yourself in the world of divorce in, in understanding how the processes work, in understanding what resolution is and what their standards and processes are are so resolutions a family justice agency so it's a it's a group that was originally set up for and by family lawyers um to try to keep families and couples out of court when they separate right so that's the that's kind of going back that's how how and why it was set up and then it became clear that actually financial planners are are really essential in this whole process particularly in the process of keeping people out of court so um they set up an accreditation which was already available for lawyers to do for financial advisors to do as well and um it's incredibly difficult um so you have to (laughs) sit you you do it all in three months so you sent the sent the papers and you have Mm. so you do it back to front so you do the second paper first so you have three months to do the second paper and you have to submit case studies of cases that you've worked on you have to submit your advice letters you have to write about um like how you felt it when anything you would do differently if you did it again and that's fine because that's reflecting on yeah things that you think you could have done better that's a good yeah I like Um, that idea actually yeah great isn't it yeah Yeah, because all they're looking for is not are you perfect but actually are you human can you learn from things and can you do them better so I really like that um so that was really good although it is really hard yeah um and then you have to do and at the same time you do two papers so you do a paper on pensions because pensions are the majority of the work that we do um around divorce and you do a paper on something called cash flow modeling, which is basically showing people how their future life might look. Mm. Um, uh, looking at their in- income and expenditure and their lifestyle and what it costs right. yeah. and the assets they've got and those sorts of things. So you do a paper on that as well. So that's paper two. <laughs> <laughs> and then paper one is a um, is a general paper. So you sent that on the Friday and you have to submit it by the Monday morning. Wow. That's a fun weekend, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> like no sleep. <laughs> no sleep. Well, just no, no nothing, just <laughs> just doing just your paper and getting it submitted. So 
Um, yeah, but <laughs> but whilst it's the longest and ha- so I did a master's a few years ago. It's the long the resolution accreditation was harder, longer, just completely like takes over your mind. But still, for me, the most valuable thing that I've that I've ever done. Wow, so. that's amazing because, like you said, you know, so often in these situations. Um, especially when you know there's a breakdown of a marriage, regardless of whether domestic abuse is involved, um, it's it's a very tense time, and there's a lot to consider, and the finances obviously are a very very large part of that because that's going to determine how you can live the rest of your life. You know, unless depend on whether you change careers or whatever you do, but essentially what you have is and obviously if children are involved as well <clears throat> there's all that that consideration um it's a stressful enough time anyway well stressful I never think is the right word it's a horrific <laughs> time. <laughs> horrific I think is the word time and trying to get all those kind of things sorted whilst you're trying to deal with emotions that are involved and everything else that's spinning 20,000 plates um then the finances and knowing that you're talking to somebody that knows what they're talking about and understands. And that is a really big part, I think, of what you do, which is incredible because if people don't get it and they don't get the situation and they're just doing it based on, well, this is my role, this is what I do, it's A, B, C, that's that. Whereas actually what you're saying is, you know, you need to immerse yourself in it, you need to understand it. And people will then feel more at ease because in those those particular years and, t- you know, that you're going through, or because it can last, I presume, sometimes it, it can go on for a hell of a long time, basically. And it's not just a quick yeah. few months and that's that. So this is something that's constantly in the background of your life every day, playing on your mind. Um, and you need to know that you've got somebody there that gets it and understands, you know, the whole process mm-hmm. and understands that you are human at the end of the day. That's what I always try and say about you don't own me and dipping in and out of Lucy's. It's about the human being. It's about the person. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all are, you know. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think all of that in in abuse situations, in situations where there's where there is somebody being abused, the abuser quite often uses the divorce to control even further, yeah. to slow down the process, to be in that person's life for even longer. So what you've what you often find in abuse situations is that the divorce, rather than being able to get it done and dusted and over with as quickly as possible, it can be carrying on for years and years and years because they use the whole process of, yes. of the divorce situation just to continue it. And mm-hmm. even after, and I don't want to scare anybody, but even after the divorce is done and dusted, sadly, the abuse can still continue. Oh, I, but hopefully you can at least push some distance yeah. and I couldn't agree more with that statement honestly I could not because I think that again it's something that I, I tried to do a blog a while ago on it in terms of post-separation abuse because it's not a term that's banded around a lot in society I mean people who I suppose work within that area understand and the people who are experiencing it understand what post-separation abuse is but it's not something that is talked about nearly enough And I think, you know, there's this this misconception that once the relationship is is over, say, for example, or or the individual manages to leave the abusive relationship, then that's it done and dusted. You know, I I did I did a podcast a while ago with Sam Fisher, who is CEO of Trafford Domestic Abuse Service. And she was saying, you know, leaving or or a healthy relationship ending, that's difficult enough because there's so much emotion. But then if you think about a domestically abusive relationship and that ending how much more difficult is that with all the control all the levels like you just said you're 100 percent right it is to keep that control because they feel like they're losing that power they're losing that control over their uh, their victim their survivor you never know there's so many terms now we can use however anybody wants to be you know identifying themselves as but but that whole post-separation abuse is um again can't even think of a word for it just just a, a living hell really because it can go on for years like you're saying if, if the finances are dragged out for years then that person is still unfortunately in some way tied to their abuser and yeah. 
this is where I think, you know, finding support, finding resources to say, okay, I can't change what's happening right now, but what I can do is find support where I know I can maybe just for a minute think, okay, so I'm not losing my mind. They are trying to keep control over me. You know, it's so important, isn't it? Because you're trying to live your life whilst one one hand's pushing you forward, another one's pulling you back. And that to me is just, it's devastating, isn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I had a, a client not so very long ago within the last few years and and that it got to a point in her divorce where she just said, I don't know if I should have just not left. Yeah. Because it was so hard. And the thing is, you don't ever want anyone to think that it would be better to stay in an abusive relationship because it's never better to stay in in an abusive relationship. And I don't, I don't think she forgot what it was like, but I think it was so hard because divorce is hard and getting the other person to agree to anything when when they're an abuser is really hard. And you really just have to keep your keep your strength, get some support, emotional support is absolutely vital in in these situations. You need somebody, whether it be a divorce coach, whether it be a therapist, um, counselor, psychologist whoever it is you need you need somebody giving you that emotional support as you get through it so you don't ever feel no it would have been better if I'd have stayed in that relationship because it it never is and it takes so much strength to leave and you know yeah we know it it takes on average seven times to leave an abusive relationship I mean imagine getting to that and then going back and starting again like it's yeah. I'm in awe of anybody who's left an abusive relationship it's an incredible show of strength to have got that far but oh, yeah don't ever think about going back because it does it does get better it really does get better and there is an end in sight oh my god I think I need I need to put that on a card <laughs> <laughs> that, that needs to be rolled up do you know what what you it's perfect exactly what you've just said and that that right there in a nutshell is precisely it because there are days you know I think in in something else I've written recently I said it, it's like um going through through an abusive relationship and trying to come out the other side it's like fighting a battle with one hand tied behind your back because you're constantly trying to move forward and and it's so so difficult and it's so difficult when you don't know where to look for support because again you know family and friends sometimes they they don't know what to say because it it isn't directly impacting them yes they're they're affected because they're your family they're your friends they care for you they love you but they are not going through it they're not walking in in your shoes and I think that's always something that I find really difficult but yeah you, you know some of the people I've worked with they they will talk about returning to the perpetrator a hundred percent because it's just well actually that is the norm that I know and understand and maybe that's better yeah. than trying to make it on my own and that's the whole point is you don't have to be on your own you know and, and different forms of support work for different people you know some people might find counseling yeah. helps some people might find group support helps and there is always some always something in your local area whether it's through you know the local council looking on their website whether it's through your local domestic abuse charity because there will be something you know in your area to go and have a look and and the thing is if it doesn't work for you try something else you know because it's never going to be like a one size fits all because everybody's experience of abuse is so unique yes there'll be I always say like there'll be threads that run through each situation that you'll say that's very similar to that or that's right but actually in essence it's that person's experience and they're unique so therefore their experience is unique and you can't sort of try and compare it too much there's a level of comparing but then that's kind of where you go actually that's that person's you know situation but it is so true that trying to leave is is the hardest thing and trying to leave when repeatedly you're being told uh for example you know somebody might say well I'm going to kill myself if you if you leave you know you'll never see the kids again if you leave and on top of that you could be going through the whole financial situation and trying to deal with that on top of potentially family court on top of trying to organize child maintenance you know because many 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 times when people I've worked with evading paying child maintenance it's another way of control you know and there's 
I, I don't think as a society we realise just how incredible those who've been impacted by abuse are, who, who have experienced it, how they get up every morning and do what they do and get children to school and do a day's work. And I just, you take your hat off, don't you, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think one of the important things to think about when you're talking about finances, when it uh, when we're talking about abuse is, is yeah. exactly what you've said, is that there's a control and that control is likely to have been there throughout marriage. Now, I always say marriage is a team or a relationship, whether you're married or not married, it's a relationship and it's, you're a team. So you play to each other's strengths. Mm. So you will do what you're best at. So it might be that the person that you're with took the lead in the finances and and you kind of took a step back because it wasn't really your thing. And so they've been arranging the insurances. They've been talking bank accounts out. They know where the mortgage is. They've, you know, everything is yeah. what they've been doing. And that's not necessarily a sign that you've, you've been in an abusive relationship. It could just be how your relationship works and it could yes. be absolutely perfect. Yeah. And that's fine. But in abusive relationships, that happens. And even when you ask, they're unlikely to give you the information about where things are. So what that adds is not this extra layer of fear mm. to the person who's coming out of that relationship because not only are they dealing with the kids, they're dealing with trying to leave this beautiful relationship, they're probably also still experiencing some control in maybe not um, paying maintenance, maybe not turning up when they're supposed to to sort out the kids, maybe like last minute, letting you know that they can't have the children when they know you're going to be at work those sorts of things will continue to happen yeah but you've got also if you've not looked after your own finances before you've also got this extra layer of fear around it because yeah but learning about money from scratch because we're not taught it at school no this is the problem there's a there is actually (laughs) On LinkedIn at the moment, there's a there's a petition to the government um to try and get a financial education into primary schools. Oh God, yes, hundred <laughs> percent. I'm behind look that. It, look it up on my uh, on my LinkedIn yeah, page. Yeah, I will. We'll be I'll be it as well. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's vitally important. Somebody started it, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and it I, it popped up on my LinkedIn the other day. So it was like, right, I'm getting signed in that because yeah. even if we had some level of of financial education I think it would massively help people when they're coming out of a relationship even if they didn't look after the money during that relationship at least they've got a base level of understanding yeah oh god Um, that's so true because you know you find it especially in in this day and age now and I'm going to sound like I'm being an old fart now but you know (laughs) we didn't have you you know she's 103 you know I am I am <laughs> just, just use a very good face cream. Um, <laughs> but you know, when, when we were growing up, you didn't have I don't I didn't have a bank account, I don't think, till I was about 17 or something. I was going off to you, you know, off to uni. Um mobile phone didn't have one of those till I was 21. And children now everything is so instant and it's so, you know, access to online um apps and this and that. And just teaching them that actually going back to kind of a bit of old school is it doesn't grow on trees, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> as your parents, you say money don't grow on trees, but we have to be more accountable ourselves as well. Don't we, that we can say, actually, yes, I understand the basics. I understand that there is council tax. I understand that there is water bills, you know, all these things that, that are going to build up and they are part and parcel of everyday mm-hmm. life. Um, Definitely, because it, it would be the scariest thing to be left in a position going, OK, so my finances are all over the place. I'm now trying to deal with bills. I'm now trying to deal with things that I didn't even. Know. And the other side is as well. You never know what the perpetrator may have in terms of debts that, you know, in your name. I've come across that before yeah. Um, where they've left, where they've opened something in your name. And because you've trusted them in the marriage and like you say, it might be that they've always been the one to deal with the finances. So, well, we'll open this in your name. Oh, okay then, because you trust them. If they've gained that Mm. trust from you. So you end up left with God knows what in your name to deal with afterwards. Um, It's a really, really scary, scary thought, isn't it? And it's just out of interest is, 
in terms of finances and things and and with mortgages say for example I don't I don't know myself but is when if two people wanted to stay in the same house you know if say for example the 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 individual who because I've come across situations where the individual doesn't want to leave they want to stay in the family home they want to give the children um the security and the stability and they don't want to uproot their whole routine and move away and all those things that you know move schools um but the perpetrator is is saying well actually no I'm you know th- those kind of situations always to me seem a lot more difficult than people can realize yeah it depends on on how um how it's all set up so yeah in some relationships you'll have so I'm going to talk about marriage because and it's really important to for anybody listening to understand that if you're not either married or in a um, civil partnership the law is completely different I'm afraid and you are not protected in the same way you might not think that what I'm about to say gives you much in the way of protection but not being married gives you unfortunately considerably less protection um so if you're married or in a civil partnership yeah. um and you live in a house together that's been the mar- family marital home um if it's in your name you don't have to sell it unless yeah. you choose right. if it's in their name they can sell it from under you but you can get an order by the court to stop the sale to right. stop any sale going on okay and yeah. moving forward if it's in joint names again you have you have some control what we've seen um in the past is that people who are in particularly in um, financial or, or economically abusive relationships the um the spouse will often the perpetrator as you've called them um will often have the house put in their own name on their own because right. they've done that for more control so they'll go oh you don't need to be on the house don't worry about that you you yeah. don't don't you worry about being on the mortgage it's not something that needs concern you will never have to worry you about don't, <laughs> you don't really earn enough anyway so you know we'll just not bother putting you on that leaves you you a little bit open so it, if you are in that position and you do want to stay in the family home at least get this court go and see a family solicitor and get this order put it put on to stop the sale of the family home until yeah. everything's resolved and sorted out. In terms of moving forward, it, it do really just it does depend on how much money there is. Are yeah. you earning enough? Can you take over the mortgage on your own? There are other possibilities, but if you're already in a controlling relationship, the other possibilities may not be things that you, you want to consider because they don't give you that clean financial break um, from the perpetrator, which you're probably going to want well, if you're in yeah. in an abusive relationship. Yeah, God, thank you. Because it's things like that that, that do crop up um, and when you're having conversations with people. And it is so difficult to think that, you know, you've started out uh, in this relationship thinking that it's, a, like you say, you know, it's a team, you're working as a team. And then to be in a position and you never think you're going to be in that position 15, 20 years, 30 years, however long down the line, that actually everything that you've built up um, or thought you'd built up was was for nothing. And you can end up in a really, you know, I, I've worked in accommodation, I've worked in refuges myself. And again, this is where I think we need to move away from this idea that there is a certain type of person that's that's a victim or survivor or whatever you want to call them of domestic abuse. It can happen to anybody. Yeah. And it's not a, mar- I keep saying this at the moment, it's not a marginalised issue. It's not, well, it only happens to this kind of, it can happen to anybody. And anybody can be in a situation where they are so financially vulnerable that they end up with no other choice than having to go into accommodation or refuge. And that's that's a really scary thought. I mean, thank God we have them, you know, and it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I take my hat off to, because I've only kind of, um when I've worked within accommodation, it's only to go in and talk to people and and I'm not actually working within there. And again, take my hat off to the staff because they're so compassionate, they're so understanding. Um, And this is people living in real crisis and not knowing where to turn. And if that's your only option, then that's devastating, isn't it? And yeah, so to, to to have that knowledge that you can go and ask for support. And I think you've raised a really important issue because somebody was talking to me about this the other day 
that if you're not married, because this this idea that people think you've got this common law marriage, is that the term people think is so therefore, even though we're not married, everything's, you know, 50-50 or what. And somebody brought this up the other day because I think something's, you know, it's been brought up within um, Parliament, isn't it, in terms of talking about this issue of if you are not married and things break down, then you are very, very vulnerable um, and you're not protected. And like you say, you need to get the advice. So that needs to be kind of out there a lot more, doesn't it, in terms of people understanding that, you know, you are very, very vulnerable. Yeah, that was a really, that's a brilliant point to make. Thank you. I think it's worth saying that the things that I said about the house and the mortgage and who owns the house, that's relevant whether you're married or in a yeah. civil partnership or yeah. if you're just living together. That That's the case with all of those things. Um, I don't know if you can get the court order because I'm not a legal professional. I don't know if you can get the court order to, to halt the sale if you're not married yeah. or in a civil partnership so that would be worth checking out with the family lawyer yeah. um but yeah absolutely this all came out recently because i'm emily thornbury um if the labor party brought it up at the labor party conference that they have plans although they weren't specific about what the plans would be and um, to change the law in england and wales so yeah that again is probably quite important to mention is the law in scotland and and northern ireland is different to the law in um in England and Wales, um, it's very strange how the UK, United Kingdom has very <laughs> different laws um, yeah. all, all over the place. But yeah, in terms of England and Wales, yeah, if you're cohabiting, if you're living with somebody else, your the protections are completely different. You can't share pensions. Um, what's yours is yours and what's theirs is theirs. You can't expect spousal maintenance or, or any sort of ongoing maintenance for yourself only for the child. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, it's it is, and I think people think that it's going to be the same, and it's just not. It's no. not even close. No, and and it is important because, you know, we keep coming back to this idea of if you you, you could be listening to this now and thinking, but I'm all right. I mean, I'm you know I'm not particularly happy in my relationship, or I'm not whatever it may be, or you may know there's little signs going on, or there's something that's just niggling you in the back of your mind. But it is so important. Don't leave it too late to go and get that kind of information and go and find out what your rights are if you like because nobody wants to see anybody in a situation where they have to go into accommodation or they're looking and and the other side of that is the the waiting list now you know unfortunately with cost of living crisis as well there are a lot of people that have ended up in accommodation refuge that, that it's just been overwhelmed and that's really sad and that's really scary but yeah it's so important to get to get the support and get that information and this is why I keep trying to with you don't own me as the website make sure there's so many resources on there for people to go and find because sometimes if you are coming out of a domestically abusive relationship you don't know where to look you know you might go to say the national domestic abuse helpline or something like that but you want to know what's close to you don't you You want to know what is there almost needs to be that kind of one-stop shop of resources no matter where you are in the country you can go with an a to z kind of index and go oh okay so it's there all right okay so i live here and also a lot of the time if you are in a situation where you have left your abusive partner you may end up and this is something that crops up very very often in conversations is why is it unfortunately always the person that is leaving that then has to move usually out of the jurisdiction they may move to a different county and with the children for their own safety Uh, and that is always you know because then you've got to start new schools there's all those kind of things and the perpetrator ends up staying in the area you know, so you've got all those kind of things, maybe having to find a new job, maybe having to, you know, there's so many financial implications that are terrifying, really. Um, and knowing, so if you were looking for support, you may potentially have sought support in your own area, but then knowing if you've had to go move 60 odd miles or something, where do you go and get support there? It's just so important to know that you're not on your own. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me of of any kind of conversation is that that person needs to know that they're not on their own they may feel like they're on their own and it's not patronizing trying to say you're not on your own because you know there are situations where you think actually I am completely on my own no one can help me no one I it's it's happening to me it cannot possibly be that anyone can 
can help, but there is help. There is so much help out there, more than than anyone probably realises. It's just knowing where it is, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think wherever you are, just go on, go on Google and yeah. and and look up your local um charity, like you said, because they are literally all over the place. I did some yeah. work recently to um to present to resolution about um financial abuse, and we were kind of trying to get a list together of local you know local um charity domestic abuse charities and honestly the list we came up with was yeah i don't say i don't even claim that we came anywhere close to having a full list of of everyone in the country but there's such a huge list and and not and also it's important to say that for minority groups as well so there's yeah. there was this uh, specialist helpline for suffering domestic abuse if you're in the lgbtq plus yes. um community as well you know there are there are lots of, of kind of niche groups that will provide support if you're in a minority group as well and i think that's really important because you might feel even more alone and that you're the only person that that looks like you that's that's going Absolutely. through that that you know Absolutely. Oh, and again, another brilliant point you've raised. It is, you know, very much um, within sort of BAME community, within LGBT, those with disabilities. You know, I, I keep trying to say this, that abuse doesn't discriminate, you know, so it, it can happen to anybody. And if you are um, potentially struggling in terms of, especially if you're in a very close knit community where you may feel like you're going to be ostracized if you Absolutely. go and talk about things and you go and have those conversations. And the, and the, I remember somebody asking me recently, is it, you know, when you go and talk to these charities, when you go and have these conversations, is it, is it anonymous? You know, is it, is it confidential? Yeah. Will, will my, and, and I know it sounds so silly to say, but it's so good to reiterate that, that it is, they're not going to go, you know, the, the, the abuser may think that they can if you never know what they can and can't find out even if they they get a whiff of it they're never going to find out what you've said they're never going to know what you've had the conversation they just don't because at the end of the day it is confidential all all the you know the the, the charities are there to help and support you those support services are there to give you the the safety that you need for yourself and if you have children you know nobody wants anyone to be at risk and the difficulty as well and I, I talked to Tony Blockley about this recently when we we're talking about um risk assessments and the sad thing is a lot of people don't see what risk level they're at because to them it is normal so if it is normal behavior that somebody has been you know violent as an example in terms of domestic because Domestic abuse is such a big umbrella, isn't it, in terms of financial yeah. abuse, obviously, the emotional abuse, psychological abuse, uh, sexual abuse, all, all these aspects are within domestic abuse. But there there is definitely help, but you, it, it's trying to help people see their level of risk and know that actually you can get that help. And it, it, even though it does seem normalised to you, eventually, over time, you can see that what that behaviour, that person, you know, the behavior they were displaying was not normal behavior and it may take a long time and no one I, and again there's no expiration date you know you, you just try and move forward each day and I think that for a lot of people it is just trying to take one step at a time and if it's ticking a box saying I've thought about finances today so I'm going to go and deal with that today that's all my head can take today is that make that phone call look up on google like you say you know look for for those kind of and within charities they will know of financial support services that you can go and talk yeah. to and you know you are supported throughout the process so take it one step at a time I would say um and not try and overface yourself because there's a lot we've, yeah, we've said a lot haven't we there that you know you might go oh my god this is like but it it oh, can be so broken cool. down yeah okay. absolutely it's worth worth mentioning a charity called um, surviving economic abuse and um, yes. so sea they are absolutely fantastic and the resources on their website are just second to none um they provide training and support for people working with um people in, in abusive relationships but they also provide a lot of support themselves to to anyone who's trying to leave an abusive relationship or who's left and it's it's specifically financial and economic abuse but 
they can help guide you to other to other places if if it's not just that or if you you feel that maybe those are not the kind of driving forces um but what we what we do tend to find is that 90 percent of abusive relationships have financial abuse in them which right. is a massive proportion um so that is probably relevant to you even if you haven't perhaps realized it because there are other things that feel you know if you're if the, you're experiencing domestic violence for example or sexual abuse you, you're not going to feel like the financial abuse is top of the list but it is probably yeah. it is probably going on even if you're not necessarily aware of it again that's another brilliant point to make because yeah it, it, there's so many layers and that's that's the thing isn't it and it is just taking it one step at a time because it can become so overwhelming and that's when unfortunately what we've gone back to from earlier is people may return to that relationship because it seems easier than trying to unpick this whole kind of layered issues of finances of, of you know every oh everything it is it is horrendous but there is support and I think the more we talk about it and the more we keep saying that there is support out there um, and again, um, surviving economic abuse, I put that on my resources page recently. I'm just constantly <laughs> trying to go, you need this, right? It's there. You need this. It's that, you know, <laughs> just, just not feeling intimidated and knowing you can just go and, and, and have a look at resources and see what is there for you. And because there's so many aspects that people don't appreciate. And I think one that I will admit, I, when I work for my local domestic abuse charity was, um, I did some training, it was called sign health. And it was talking about those uh, with disabilities and um, uh, deaf people and talking about how do they communicate when they are being abused. And it was just a real eye opener. It was it was really frightening to see, you know, having to get a, a, an interpreter to if, if something has occurred and the police are involved, that kind of thing. It's it's terrifying. Add to that financial stresses and worries and everything else that goes on, you know, you just, you, I think most people would just go, you know what, like you say, you take your hat off, don't you? You just take your hat yeah. off to people and go, how are you coping with all that is unbelievable. But you can just break it down into bite-sized pieces and say, okay, today I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to work on that. I can't worry about that right now. That's going to have to wait. That'll have to go to the back of the queue and just take it one step at a time because you can't take it all on in one go. But yeah, yeah that, it's so important to get the information right, isn't it? It's so important to get that information. And from everything you've said this morning, um, well, I've learned things as well. So I'm just saying, <laughs> and this is what I love about it, because I'm always saying, like, I'm not an expert in every area, but I just I'm so passionate about learning more myself because everybody if we all learn a little bit more and one person takes away that little thing and somebody else takes away that little thing, then maybe we'll all be a bit more understanding of the complexities of domestic abuse. Absolutely. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> oh, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to have to get you back because these pearls of wisdom, you need to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I have written a book, but it's about yeah. divorce. <laughs> well, I co-wrote one. We'll get that on the resources page as well. There you go. Amazing. It's all, it's all relevant. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for this morning. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Well.